Within our Christian tradition in the Lutheran heritage, the gospel for Good Friday is taken from St. John, the 18th chapter, to chapter 19, the 42nd verse. It's quite a long passage, so please remain seated as you hear today's gospel reading. And then immediately following, I will have from Luther's large catechism, his brief explanation on that petition that we keep saying over and over and over, but deliver us from evil, or another way of phrasing it is deliver us from the evil one. And please keep that in the back of your mind or in the front of your mind as you hear today's gospel reading. Remember, we do not fight against people. Our battle on this earth is not against flesh and blood. It's not against brother or sister. But the battle has always been between uh, our Lord Jesus and the evil one who we know as the devil, Satan, in whom seeks to rob, to steal, and to destroy our life in Christ. When Jesus had finished praying, he left his disciples and crossed the Kindred Valley. On the other side, there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he. When Jesus, and Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. And Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. I shall not drink the cup the fa shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but Peter had to wait outside the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. No, I'm not. It was cold and the servants and the officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I've always taught in the synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why, why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I have said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him on the face. Is this the way that you answer the high priest, he demanded? 
if I've said something wrong, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there warming himself. So they asked him, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? No, I'm not, I'm not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Pilate then went back inside the palace. He summoned Jesus and he asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied, your own people and chief priest handed you over to me. What is it that you have done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews, gathered there, and he said, I find no basis for a charge against him, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, No, not him! Give us Barabbas! Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and pushed it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again and again saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they slapped him on his face. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said, behold, here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and the officials saw Jesus, they shouted, Crucify! 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 But Pilate answered, You take him and you crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. But the Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. 
When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said, don't you realize that I have the power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out, sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover, and it was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother. His mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary from Magdala. Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took Mary into his home. Later, Knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. And when he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. 
Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other man. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you may also believe. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night, and Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and alloys, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. <clears throat> When we hear this gospel, I will uh, say that for many a time it's rather lengthy. We're not used to hearing such length when we read a scripture passage. But on the occasional Sunday like today, on the occasional day like today, it's good to hear the entire passage so that again we are reminded clearly of the story of Jesus' death, you know? It's kind of strange to hear that there are people today in our community, like even cameras, who do not know the real story of Jesus' suffering and death. And uh, so it's good for us, in my opinion, that we hear it. When we pray the Our Father who art in heaven, which we commonly know as the Lord's Prayer, or really it's called the Kingdom's Prayer, it's divided into certain petitions, seven of them to be exact. And at the end or near the end of the Lord's Prayer, there is a petition that we often say, but deliver us from evil, amen. Uh, oftentimes the word for thine is the glory, the power of the kingdom uh, was added after, but the prayer itself, when you take a look at it from St. Luke and Matthew ends at, but deliver us from evil or, as I'm going to point out, or Luther points out for us, the evil one. In the Greek, this petition, deliver or keep us from the evil one or the wicked one, is what the words say. The petition seems to be speaking of the devil as the sum of all evil in order that the entire substance of our prayer may be directed against our arch enemy. It is he who obstructs everything that we as God's children pray for, God's name or glory, God's kingdom and will, our daily bread, a good and cheerful conscience, and so on. Therefore, we sum it up all by saying, Dear Father, help us to get rid of all this misfortune. 
Nevertheless, this petition includes all the evil may, that may befall us under the devil's kingdom, poverty, shame, death, and in short, all the tragic misery and heartache of which there is no in of which there is so much on the earth since the devil is not only a liar but also a murderer he insistently seeks our life and vents his anger by causing accidents and injuries to our bodies makes you wonder doesn't it like you know you you've had this sudden fall the sudden illness. You know, Luther's pointing out that in his opinion, in his understanding, a cause or the cause may be and is the devil. He breaks many a man's neck and drives other to insanity. Some the devil drowns and many he hounds to suicide and other dreadful catastrophes. Therefore, there is nothing for us to do on earth but to pray and keep praying constantly against this arch enemy. For if God did not support us, we would not be safe from him for a single hour. Thus you see how God wants us to pray to him for everything that affects our bodily welfare and directs us to seek and expect help from no one but him. But this petition he has put at the last, for if we are to be protected and delivered from all evil, his name must be first hallowed in us and his kingdom come among us and his will be done within us, then we will persevere from sin and shame and from everything else that seeks to harm or to injure us in our life in Christ. Deliver us from evil. Deliver us from the evil one. Again, I remind us we are, you know, we are citizens of the, some will say the 21st century. I hope you're thinking a little further. We are citizens, really, of the 22nd, maybe even the 23rd century. And to ponder that there is a devil, that there is an evil that seeks to hurt and to harm us sounds so strange to the ears of many people. Yet on this day, Good Friday, when you take opportunity to ponder Jesus, remember, it was because of the evil one who put a seed of doubt in our ancestral parents, Adam and Eve, that caused them to rebel against God. And as a consequence of that, all of humanity now is inflicted and afflicted by this inherent sin, the cause of that was the evil one. And thanks be to God that in Christ Jesus our Lord, he willingly comes to the cross, and in his body, he not only provides for us the grace uh, and the cleansing blood for our sin, but as we are reminded, it is the cross of Christ that destroys the power of the evil one. And it is to that cross today that we come and cling so dear in our life. Amen.